one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial locomotives the EMD or Electromotive Division of General Motors ever produced was the BL2. This unique at best or just plain ugly at worst looking locomotive was a knee-jerk response to the new type road switchers being introduced in the market, such as Alco's RS1 and Fairbanks Morris's H1044. Both of these competitor companies' offerings would debut long before the BL2. So long, in fact, one might wonder what GM was thinking, and that's a good question. For the longest time, the General essentially assumed that these other companies, such as Baldwin, Fairbanks, Morris, etc., as well as Alco, didn't know what they were doing and were not a big threat. Furthermore, EMD seemed incapable of being able to grasp the fact that someone could have actually come out with a better mousetrap, so to speak. To fully and or better understand this statement, let's take a look at what early locomotive production in the United States around this period was like, or the debut of the road switcher. Initially, there were two basic types of locomotives. Road locomotives, such as this one here, designed to pull long trains at high speeds, and certainly highly capable at this job, they were pretty much useless for switching duties as there was no place for the conductor to stand on either end of the locomotive to facilitate switching, nor did they have the proper visibility and or sight lines to see the conductor as they move the train around tight yards and clearances. Furthermore, some of these large giants would simply be incapable of fitting down these tight spurs and sidings, making them completely useless in those regards. Then, of course, there were the switchers. Much more compact, much less powered, but very flexible and capable of squeezing in and out of tiny spaces and with great visibility to allow for safety in terms of switching and convenience as well, allowing the conductor to move from one end of the engine to the other with very little in hindrance thanks to the catwalk set across the side of these engines. The American Locomotive Company, or ALCO, then suddenly had a brainstorm. Responding to a request from the Rock Island Railroad which needed a locomotive that could do commuter service as well as freight haulage and standard main line service, came up with the simple concept of combining both the properties of a switcher with the road locomotive into one convenient and flexible package. They essentially took an S-style switcher, apparently an S2, extended the frame enough to accommodate a small hood, allowing for the placement of a steam generator, and also lengthening the engine to the point where road trucks could be placed underneath it, the small trucks on these engines again not being able to handle high speeds, and Viola. They had the world's first road switcher, the RS1 to be precise. While the engine was underpowered, it planted a seed. It was capable of doing everything from hauling commuter traffic in the morning to handling locals or freights during the day. It could then bring said commuters home after work, completing its cycle and basically maximizing its time of availability and usage. A rail foreman's dream. In sharp contrast to the steam switchers of the time, which would have required much downtime and were only so flexible. At least part of the same could be said about the diesel road and switcher engines of the day. While the road locomotives were powerful enough to haul trains at high speeds, they lacked the visibility to handle the switch jobs as mentioned before. And while the switchers had the visibility and flexibility, they lacked the ability to reach the speeds as was necessary to complete the high speed jobs on the main line. The engine was quickly dismissed by EMD as nothing but a cobbled together half assed attempt created by a bunch of country tinkerers who barely knew a thing about mass productions. EMD was so ignorant and arrogant about this whole situation that they refused to regard this as a market. As said before, that was until approaching the mid-40s, when it became very clear that there was a market for an engine that could pretty much do it all in one convenient package, and many railroads were willing to pay for it, shown by early sales of the RS-1 before the war and after the war. as well as the HH series from Fairbanks Morris and some successful models from Baldwin, although these proved troublesome and would die out of the market quickly. The last straw appeared to be the RS2, introduced in 1946 and equipped with Alco's troublesome but powerful 244, cranking out a whopping 1500 horsepower. The best horsepower output EMD could offer at the time was with an early version of its 567 producing 1200 horsepower, 
It also lacked anything resembling a road switcher in its catalog of products to sell its customers. Something clearly had to be done. AMD then came up with its new jerk response, the BL2. Throwing this locomotive together is essentially what AMD did. They took a standard AMD F3 unit, installed their brand new 567 16-cylinder prime mover, known as the 567B in place, which made 1500 horsepower, and did some work around the frame to give it as much visibility as possible. This included trimming down the nose to give more visibility for the engineer forward, as well as trimming down the back of the nose to allow for a rear-facing window for visibility toward the rear. Porches were put in place, but they were very hard to accommodate. Essentially, again, the shell had to be pushed back along the second frame. These locomotives in their FT form and or F-series locomotive form were always called covered wagons. Why, you ask? Because essentially, that's what they were. The locomotive, unlike most engines of the time, possessed two shells. One internal shell, which was meant for structure, and the external shell, which was meant for looks or streamlining. Or at least that was the original plan. The fact is, to make the two shells strong enough to withstand the stresses of being a road locomotive, EMD had to make them dependent upon each other. This created massive problems in terms of keeping the structures tight enough as if the outer shell was removed, it would reduce the structural rigidity of the locomotive drastically. The end result of this is that compromises had to be made. The shell was cut back on the nose as well as on the tail to allow for space for the conductor to stand on either side. There was not enough room to put a full-on staircase safer for switching, and so a ladder had to be employed, much like the FT engine had. This is dangerous in itself as ladders are more dangerous to grab at speed when performing switching operations. There was no room to put a catwalk across the locomotive to let the conductor to move from one end to the other. This meant that the conductor would have to get off on the front of the engine and run alongside to the back ladder and climb back onto the engine in order to perform rapid switch moves. The, and I quote, unique body of the locomotive also impacted visibility, specifically rearward or long hood forward, as the small window had to be carved out between the structure and strengthening areas of the cab itself and the cab, because of the way the design of the frame was, could not be raised. The end result, the engineer had the equipment of a mailbox to look through to see what was going on ahead of the long hood. This is specifically a big problem, as the long hood by itself obstructed view. Not practical and not exactly safe either. Furthermore, because the actual side of the locomotive had to be stripped away to provide any visibility for the engineer, the view along this side was further narrowed. Other flaws included maintenance on the locomotive itself. In order to have major maintenance taken care of, the whole shell would literally have to be pulled off, as the prime mover itself was buried beneath the shell and there were no doors to access it. The end result, despite the fact that the BL2 was a diesel locomotive, which were known for low cost and low maintenance, the BL2's maintenance costs would be higher and its downtime longer, as the shell essentially again had to be removed for anything except very minor repairs in order to access the prime mover. The end result of this and several other technical problems as a result of the quote uniqueness and rushed nature of this particular locomotive was that only 59 of these units were sold. The railroads at the time, for the most part, that purchased this engine found the locomotive highly impractical. Even though it was equipped with a steam generator option to haul passengers much like Alco had done with its RS series, and even though EMD had promoted the engine as being just as flexible as these road switchers being offered by its competitors, it really wasn't. The fact of the matter is the crew could not easily perform switching jobs when utilizing the engine and branch line services. The engine wasn't streamlined enough to handle the high-speed passenger services and due to its ugly looks probably wouldn't be utilized for that task anyway. As for short-term commuter services, this was a problem again as the locomotive needed to be down for maintenance so often that it couldn't be reliably assigned to this particular task as commuter trains needed to be more, as reliable if not more reliable than standard passenger service. In short, it is highly unclear as to who... GM built this locomotive for. It wasn't practical for freight and or switching services as the small porches on either end of the locomotive did not have a catwalk to link them 
and only featured small steep ladders for the crew to scramble up, which was dangerous during switching moves as mentioned earlier. The engine lacked the visibility due to the unusual design to be used around these type situations specifically for spotting the crew, and wasn't that much more compact compared to the switchers of the time and or the road switchers being offered by companies like Alco and Baldwin, as well as Fairbanks Morris. As for high-speed passenger service, the, shall we say, unique looks didn't exactly help it there either. Railroads at the time were struggling to maintain passenger service, and an ugly duckling like this wasn't going to impress anybody. The same story went with high-speed freight services, as this ugly duckling was not going to convey anything resembling sophistication. Essentially, the locomotive looked like a kid's science project that was not refined and essentially thrown together at the last second, which, in all intents and purposes, describes this engine to a T. Because of this and other reasons mentioned before, few of these locomotives exist to this day, and fewer of these are even in operation. One exception is the Saratoga North Creek, or former Saratoga North Creek Railroad, as the company has since been shut down, which operated a BL2, an excursion service, in Saratoga Springs, located in upstate New York. Now, this is not to say that EMD had permanently shot itself in the foot. Quite the contrary. The GP7 would debut a few years later and essentially blow the industry away, including Alco. For various obvious reasons, which I hope have been made quite clear by this documentary so far, the locomotive looks completely different. It has the recessed area by the cabs to further accommodate the vision of either hood forward, short or long. It also features a porch area on either end of the locomotive linked by a catwalk. In addition to all of these things mentioned, the front and rear porches now have actual stairs to allow the crew to safely climb on as the locomotive moves back and forth during switch moves. This drastically improves safety as well as efficiency. In terms of maintenance, the locomotive was a drastic improvement as well, as it had doors now over the prime mover itself, allowing for easy access. The shell would therefore not need to be removed for access to the prime mover. Essentially, the GP7 was everything the BL2 wasn't. Few things were carried over, mainly the generator, the prime mover, and the traction motors. These were essentially the only salvageable parts. And while they were impractical and useless on the BL2, once placed in this particular body and repackaged accordingly, they were able to finally show their full potential, allowing the EMD GP7 to sell quite well Specifically, 2,729 units, which was not only more than double of all of Alco's RS3 production, its most popular locomotive at the time, but more than all of its competitors put together of the time. Blowing the doors off of its competition, and cementing EMD as one of the powerhouses in North American locomotive production. The company would go on to essentially dominate North American locomotive production until an unlikely source popped up to challenge it. After its competitors, Sparabanks Morris and Alco went out of business, former Alco partner turned competitor GE began to make serious inroads into the market. Despite being considered somewhat of a joke due to the performance of its early U-boat locomotives, which were prone to reliability and electrical problems, these issues were ironed out. And eventually, come the 2000s, the company would soon dominate the market all by itself. Producing for a long period of time the only Tier 4 capable locomotive for Tier 4 emissions in the United States. Something EMD still hasn't quite gotten as of the moment this video is being produced. Reducing EMD's market share, now known as EMC Corporation, down to 30%. With GE now holding the lion's share. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. If you really liked it, please subscribe. And as always, keep the metal side down.